In this step-by-step -step tutorial, we'll look into how to use Midjourney AI so that you can create your first architectural concept design. Now, it's very much early days of AI technology and there are plenty of AI render engines out there. But when it comes specifically to architecture, Midjourney AI is one of the easiest and most fun to use. Now, the first thing to know is that Midjourney doesn't really have a user interface. Instead, it uses a Discord, which is a messaging service, in order to interact with its users. And so the first thing you have to do is to create an account with the Discord. So for that, I'm gonna go to login page in Discord, hit register, and then I'm gonna input my details. So this is Discord interface. The next thing we need to do is we need to link Midjourney AI to it. So for that, we're gonna go to Midjourney website, which looks like this. And then I'm gonna click join the beta and it will ask me to connect. So now you can see the Midjourney has been added to my Discord account and it's this little logo over here. There are several sections, info, support, and the one that's most interesting to us is this newcomer section. And there are three channels within that. And you can pick any of those, uh, it doesn't matter which one, in order to create your first image. So let's go ahead and create our first image. So to do that, we have to type in forward slash imagine followed by space. And this is gonna bring up this little prompt sign over here and I will enter door as the first prompt and hit enter and we can't actually create an image before we accept the terms and conditions so I'm gonna go ahead and click that over here and now if I do the same enter imagine followed by door and hit enter. I'm gonna start rendering over here. Also, as you can see, it's quite easy to get lost with all these other images and user keep generating content. So here we are, this is the first image. If I click on this, it will bring up a bigger version of that image. And if I click this button here, open in browser, it will then bring up the full resolution image. And we can see the various images that it's created. And you know, it's pretty impressive uh, considering I only typed in one word. If for what for whatever reason I lose my images somewhere in the chat and I can't find them, all I have to do is to go to inbox button over here, top right, and then go to mentions over here. I can see my first image over here, but I can also jump into the chat to locate it. And underneath here, there are a couple of useful buttons. So the first row here is about upscaling the image. So I can pick any of these images and by hitting one of these buttons, I can upscale the relevant image so the way it counts it starts with the first image over here from the left then the second over here and third and fourth on the bottom we have the version buttons so any of these images I can turn them into alternative version by hitting that button or I can choose to redo the whole composition by just clicking this button here and it will use the exact same prompt in order to regenerate the images so let's see if I can upscale probably the image number two and then I probably want to see a variation on say image number one and all I have to do is just to press once um, it will go ahead and start rendering it can be quite difficult to see where my renders are at so I could go to inbox and see dimensions over here being rendered or alternatively I can try and find them in the chat okay and here it is the variation on that one image that I had um, pretty cool. They're all quite close together in terms of the appearance, but I think I'm quite pleased with that effect. Okay, and here is the upscaled version of another door that I've chosen over here. So by default, the resolution of these images is 1024 by 1024 pixels. And it's the same for this upscaled version and the versions where you have four images side by side. As we have seen so far, Midjourney AI is reliant on the prompts in order to generate images. And it can handle anything from a single word up to a 6,000 characters. And so this means you can be as vague or as detailed as you want in your prompts. But in order to have more control and to generate more compelling images, we have to know how prompts work. So in essence, Midjourney gives priority to the words located at the beginning of the prompt and less of a priority at the end. So what this means for creators is that if you want to see something in your image, you do need to include those words at the very front of the description. And then the back tail of the description is usually reserved for all the attributions and characteristics that that image has to have. Okay, so now let's look at the structure of the prompt in a bit more detail. Now, the first thing you want to include at the beginning of the prompt is the main subject. And 
and that can be a simply a noun, an object, or a well-defined phrase or a word that the AI will be able to easily recognize. This is the absolute must-have that you want to see in your image. So for example, if I type in Italian Gothic church morning light interior and hit enter, this will produce a result like this. Again, because I used very clear prompts, it kind of came back with a very decent result, I'd say. Kind of what I wanted to see, maybe a touch gloomy, but apart from that, I'm quite happy. So this is another example of a project created within community. Prompt starts with a contemporary glass luxury residential retreat inspired by Frank Lloyd Wright in a forest oasis, etc. The second part of the prompt that we want to include is the subject attributes. So this is where we describe the subject properties and features that it includes. We can include architectural style or even an artist style that inspired this work, for example. Things like color, texture, mood, lighting, and all the adjective words are really useful to use in this as well. As an example of that is this image over here that used relatively few prompts to describe the kind of vibe and the mood that they're after. So you can see that they use natural volumetric lighting, realistic high detail to get across the kind of deserty feel and vibe of this image. Another example that I quite like is this one here. Here they actually included a name of a Dutch fashion designer in the description in order to generate this kind of moody render over here which I quite like. And they also added rain fog at the end. I guess this is why the whole image is black and white. And then we have image like this as well which is a quite clear demonstration of adding secondary descriptors in order to get the vibe and the feel across. This image uses prompts like tower in a beautiful landscape with a hedge maze and the sea views. And this is exactly what Mid Journey has produced in this case. Okay, the third thing we can add to our description is the aesthetic qualities of the image. And this is kind of related to the previous point, but this time the descriptors that you use are not to do with the qualities of the object, it is to do with the style of the image. So this is where we can specify the expression of the image, whether it's vectorized or realistic image, whether it's you know black and white or color, all those things that basically add the character and the vibe to the image, we can put in this area. And here's an example of just how far you can push this analysis. The main prompt in this artist's work was a woman followed by a descriptor of various kinds. So you can see here how the subject is still the same but is the attribute descriptor that makes all the difference in the appearance of these images. Here's another example of how aesthetic qualities of the image have been described in this work here. Again, very detailed descriptions, but you can see how, you know, certain keywords like facade, flat, vector, input of different styles, and then also artistic movements have all influenced the final appearance of this artwork. So I think that's quite neat. Another example is this, which is completely different. This is in the style of oil painting. Um, and again, you can see the descriptors that they've used over here. And then we also have advanced rendering attributes. Sometimes you want to um, include a bit more details towards the end, a bit more technical things. So if we go back to our previous descriptor, we can add things like, you know, 4K resolution to increase the sharpness. We can say that, you know, ISO has to be quite high so that the image has to be quite bright. Perhaps we'll say that we want a more of a fisheye effect so we'll put 18 millimeter lens to this and I'll add high detail as well just to get the point across about the level of detail that I want. So you can see here comparing the first image and the second one, the second is already much brighter um, which is because I've included the ISO setting but I could probably get it even a bit more brighter and for that what I can do is I can I'll use the same prompts but this time what I'll do is I'll increase the importance of some of these words so to do that what I need to do is to put double colon and then the number following that so I'll say light the word light will be 10 the word gothic will be 5 actually maybe I'll put 15 and press enter and hopefully what that will do is that will make the image even brighter because that's a priority for me in this case okay well you can see here it didn't quite make the whole thing brighter but it did intensify the light compared to this image Kind of just made it a bit more vivid the lights coming through maybe if i put bright interior instead and i'll use importance of 10 or 15 for the word bright okay well that's definitely much brighter than before i did kind of want the interior to become brighter but 
the program decided to make the source of the light brighter, which I guess, you know, is expected. It's not super precise in that sense. You know, sometimes architects want a bit more control over the final image, and I don't think it's quite there yet to be able to understand exactly what we are after. Although, if I were to play with these prompts for a bit more, I probably would be able to get something closer to what I actually wanted to. I think the most important thing about the prompts is just to have a feel for how they work. Um, you can also check out other artists' works and you can do that by going to Midjourney Community Showcase and this will have a lot of artwork over here that, you know, if you click on any of those, they'll bring up the prompts that they use. So you can study those or copy and paste them onto the clipboard in order to kind of store the ones that you think are more interesting in order to create your own later. There are also services like Noonshot or Fraser that you can use to generate your prompt with a bit more control and a bit more ease. But really I would try to advise to get an intuitive understanding of how the prompts work first before using those services. Okay, the other thing to mention is the subscription. Now the free version does have 25 prompts available that you can use up and if I type in info I'll see that I have so far used seven images out of 25 available which is about a third during the duration of this video. So you can see how quickly these prompts go really and you can see here that there are a couple of plants available. Now make sure that you switch to monthly billing if that's how you want to pay for it. I have a currently basic plan for $10 a month. And this is purely just to give me an optionality of either bailout if I don't want to use Journey anymore or upgrade to a higher end plan. The difference between these plans is that basic plan has about 200 images per month, which might be not sufficient for some users depending on how intensely they use them. A $30 plan has 15 hours of GPU time, which means that basically you can generate up to 900 images. And it also has the relaxed generations available which basically means that you can generate unlimited number of images but they would be given a lower priority uh, compared to the faster generated images and the pro plan is very similar to the standard plan with the exception that it has the twice the capacity for the fast image generations and it also has the stealth image generation which basically means that none of the images are visible to the community now the ethos of how mid journey works is that it's supposed to be shared across the community that's how the free, basic and the standard plan all work. But if you want to have something a bit more advanced than that, and perhaps you don't want to share your work before it's ready, then pro plan probably would be a bit more suitable. With the paid plans as well, the commercial use is allowed. So you can basically sell your images with these plans and you cannot do that with the free version. Let me know in the comments below if you want to see more AI related content on this channel. Check out some other videos on this channel as well. I hope you enjoyed this video and I will see you in the next one.